guest this evening is an award-winning multi-instrumentalist. He founded Verge Studios in 2014 and has produced the highest quality content since day one. Please welcome to the Eclectic Arts Virtual Studio, Mr. George Varghese. Hello. Hi, Mark. Hi, Hi, George. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Thank you oh, for having me. No, thank you for joining me. I'm so glad that you're here and uh, that we get a chance to uh, catch up and let everybody out there know about uh, what you do and on how well you do it. And uh, let's kind of start from the top with some topical things in terms of COVID-19 and, you know, the protests and everything that's been going on out there. Um, mm -hmm. how, how have you been doing the last three, four months? Yeah, it's been a obviously interesting phase for everybody. A uh, tough one, but um, uh, especially because I have a little six-year-old that made the formula a little bit more interesting uh, given there are no schools. But uh, since I'm now doing music as a guitar player and a, and a studio owner full-time, uh, I have a little bit of flexibility of my time. So I'm able to work in the nights, work um, between school hours, online school hours. So I've been uh, changing my model a lot from uh, having clients come in and record to uh, educating them how to, rec to buy a good microphone maybe and record at home, how to upload tracks and send, send to me the highest quality. So it looks like um, through this last few months, there's been a lot of musicians who have become recording engineers in the process, <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and uh, that has helped a lot. So a lot of remote working, working uh, on mixes, helping get, uh, one of the things that helps a lot is the, I'm able to play a few instruments like the drums and keyboards and guitar. So I can get demos ready, get a lot of production ideas ready so that then with the hope of when things start to ease, we can now replace tracks with better drummers and better keyboard players. Okay, so that, that makes sense. So you have uh, at least there's things that you've been able to, as we talked about pre-show, you've been able to pivot a bit during this time mm -hmm. to keep things moving, keep things rolling. Um, you were mentioning to me that you're working with people that are really in other parts of the country um, mm -hmm. on projects, not just local things here in Washington. So um, how do people, like you were mentioning, I think it was the, uh, the choir from San Diego that you've been working with. How do how did they get first get in contact with you to work on the project? So... Uh with that specific choir, uh, I'm involved a lot with the Grammys. Uh, so the last five years I've been, um, as a voting member, I head to, to LA or to New York for the actual event. And uh, so there are a lot of other Grammy members who we meet at these events. So whether it's Grammys, whether it's an ASCAP Expo, or whether it's uh, NAM in, in uh, California, using those opportunities to, to uh, show people what you do, that helped. So either as a guitar player, but now, showing people, hey, I have the studio with these unique qualities. And then they say, hey, can you, and it starts off with inviting someone over to the studio. So when they were, they were visiting Seattle, they actually came over and visited the studio because there are studios all over the world. Why would they send your tracks to uh, Seattle? But when they come in, I think the number one thing that people find about World Studios is it's not uh, just brick and wall. It's, it's the ambience. It's the, it's the comfort level of working with someone who's going to take your track all the way to, to the end. So I think um, uh, we say it's more about the person, it's more about the, the work that we do than the concept of a studio. So yeah, meeting these people at events like the Grammys and, uh, and then showing them that it's more than just mics and preamplifiers, but it's a, it's a relationship. Okay, and, and that makes a, a lot of sense because it, and I think anyone that's ever done any level of sales, um, and I did that a little bit myself, is that um, it really is about the relationship. It's not about the product that you're trying to, in my case, sell to somebody. It's about me as a person and my, that, well, that working relationship with somebody. Um, you know, why would they buy something from me when they could buy it from 20 other people? It's like, well, they like how I am or how I do my business. Or I get back to them on time and all those kind of things. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you kind of mentioned that um, you've been uh, associated with the Grammys for you know, a number of years. How does, for someone like me who doesn't have a clue how that works, do you have to have certain credentials that you get invited to be a part of this or how does that whole thing happen? Yeah, uh, it actually started in 2015, just after my child was born. And uh, till then I was part of five bands performing almost every month, a few shows. Uh, every weekend I would go all the way to Sumner and perform, sometimes out of the city. But once uh, I'm in Oregon and once she was born, I, everything came to a stop. And I was like, what do I do next? How do I, I um, 
at least till I can actually start going out and playing again, what do I do? So then uh, someone recommended, why don't you try putting your music out and see where it can go in terms of the Grammys at the highest level of uh, success. And someone mentioned the Grammys. So I started reading up what that process would be. And it turns out that you can be either as a student or you can be an associate Grammy member. All you have to do is have six songs which are released, at least the requirements back then. It could have changed a little, but six songs released. And I had six songs released. So I applied for being an a associate member. And then um, oh, I actually went over, once you have that, you have the ability to buy tickets and attend the event. I went over and attended the event. And at that point, I didn't know anybody. I was getting introduced to a few people. But at the event, there are a lot of these get-togethers where people are trying to meet other people. So other voting members. So I would like ask one person, where are you going tomorrow? And just go into these little meetups. And uh, again, it's not about just being there to show off your music. It was going there to, to make a friend, uh, to find out what other people are doing. It wasn't, because I went to the ASCAP before that, a year before, and I was like, here's my CD, here's my CD, and that didn't work. <laughs> that <laughs> nobody is like there, because everyone's there to show you what they have, just like I was trying to show my music. So at that point, it was like, what do you have? And I started listening to more people. And once you start listening, they're like, let's stay in touch. And year after year, I just started making more and more friends. And it became, I, I go there every year. It's been six years. It's more to just hang out with all these people I know now and uh, have a good time watching the event, enjoying the music. And that was the process. And to become a voting member, you have to have 12 songs released. But then there's now it's gotten a little bit more strict where you need to have an active music profile and uh, an active schedule. Okay, oh, that's that's fascinating. I had no clue how that how that worked. And thank you for um, you know sharing that with all, all of us. Now now we all know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's kind of go back a little bit. Um, when you were first starting out as a musician, uh, like how old were you? What kind of got you into? Was guitar your first instrument? Uh, kind of fill us in on the background. Yeah, uh, music, my first instrument would have been uh, learning wise was the guitar, but there was a piano back in my home, which I used to plinkety plonk on, but didn't make any sense of it because it wasn't even in tune. Uh, and uh, it wasn't, it was an old German piano. But then uh, uh, I didn't even have a guitar back then. Uh, so in India, there's this little instrument, which is which they sell on the streets, which is actually a mud pot with a bamboo stick sticking out and a wire, which is kind of strung. So I was taking that and it actually came with a bow, but I was like taking it with my finger and trying to play tunes from a, from a children's album, which I had heard back then. And my mom and sister heard that and said, hey, you're actually making a tune out of that. So why don't you learn guitar? So I, I this was in seventh grade. So I'm in 89, 1989. Uh, so I went to this teacher who had 40 students in one session and so we're all sitting there with our really like the guitar back then cost it like three dollars uh, and i still have that guitar here and it was really hard to learn when there are 40 students the teachers in the front trying to explain but but then he was able to single me out and said hey you you've got a you've got a real passion because i was trying my best so he sent me to a dedicated teacher uh robert xavier who taught me for three months uh by then the only thing i could think of was music and guitar it was like 10 to 15 hours a day of just playing. It was just an acoustic, a small little, small body. But uh, so that was from age 12 till about 16. At 16, I um, was at a school where they had a piano and I, I said, I'm gonna teach myself that because I couldn't afford classes. So I started uh, Plinkety Plunk again, but uh, over time, and I also want to start a band. So I started learning how to play the keyboard so I could teach people to play in the band. Then I taught myself the drums too. And then we got a little group together and uh, we, I started writing. I don't know what made me write, but uh, back then. So I started writing music, playing it with the band. And as the years got by, I loved that concept. And over till 2003 in India, it was just playing and playing and playing. After that, there was no stopping. Wow. that's <clears throat> So it sounds like as soon as you um, kind of caught the music bug, it got to you good. <laughs> and you just I never let yeah. up. It was either attending shows and watching other bands, even if it was the craziest of situations. Uh, remember driving, riding with a friend at the back of his bike for three hours in the rain to some godforsaken city <laughs> and riding back in the middle of the night. I remember a tree had fallen down, we had to take another route 
came back freezing cold in the rain, but just to watch like a two hour concert. <laughs> we, don't, we would do anything to watch shows back then and perform. And uh, I think in India, between the span of 2000, uh, 1995 and 2003, I performed over 750 shows. Um, and uh, by the end, it was with a band called Mixed Fruit Jam. Uh, performing at the stadium for about 40,000 people. So that was like some of the highlights of my uh, time in India or uh, opening for Brian Adams. And, um, but then when I came to the US, uh, I thought that it was going to be the same. And uh, from 2005 to 12, I think the max audience we had was 60 and we were like happy. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a very different experience. And that's kind of what really led me to start to record. I said, you know what, it's really hard to cut through and and uh, get an audience and restart a whole who and who's this guy, George. And I was more trying to sell myself to bands to try and get them to have me in, but it was hard. So I said, let me start recording myself and putting myself on the internet, which was my space back then. And that opened up this whole door towards the studio and recording and all of that. Okay, that's, oh, that's fascinating. Um, when did uh guitarists like joe satriani come into your your purview 96 i remember in college uh, another guitar player named arjun castellino he was he had a washburn i still had my two dollar guitar and that was i if for about eight years i had that guitar and he had this washburn and he was playing joe satriani surfing with the alien i'm like what on earth is that how do you get that <laughs> sound first because i had an acoustic and i didn't know how that sound was coming out and he said, yeah, you got to buy this gadget. I didn't know. So I had to write a letter, handwritten letter to my aunt to get me um, a guitar. And seven years later, I got my first electric. It took me seven years to get it shipped from the U.S. But yeah, uh, Satriani was through this guy. And I heard the album Extremist, which, um, oh, my God, I tried to work out all the songs there and, uh, and learned a lot from that, that album. Wow. So... So basically, like you mentioned of how you started, it's, and you, you did have some lessons in, uh, in a group setting, and then you had a, a more of a private setting. Um, but it sounds like you may not have, um, it wasn't like you spent 10 years studying guitar. You kind of went off on your own, basically. It was three months, three months of learning the chords, the C, E minor, A minor, F, G7 rhythms, um, learning uh, You Are My Sunshine, Una Paloma Blanca, those kind of songs for about three months. But then my teacher gave me a cassette and said, take this cassette home and, and listen. And I didn't know any of those bands, but I heard all the songs. And today I know what the songs are. It was Deep Purple and uh, Guns N' Roses and Metallica and Scorpions. And I had no idea. I was just working on all the songs, not knowing who they were and why I liked it so much. And I remember working out Eruption from Van Halen, not knowing it was Van Halen. And back then, when I was like growing up, I was told Van Halen was devil music. So later on, when I found out that I was actually playing it, I was like, oh, it's not. it was actually an interesting moment. But um, um, yeah, I worked on a lot of music without knowing who they were, because it was just a mixtape. And my teacher gave me that and said, I worked at the Hotel California or Scorpions and um, uh, Led Zeppelin. So that's where it all started. He gave me the tape. He said, I can't play this, but if you want, you can figure it out. <laughs> so once I started listening, I started working on my own, on, a, on that small guitar. I should bring it over. Okay. All right. Oh, that's, that's uh, an amazing story. And I love the fact that he gave you a tape, a mixed tape, and you're just like, I don't know who these are, but I'm going to listen to it. And I kind of like it and just start learning what was on the tape and then find yeah. out later who, who they were <laughs> and, and that kind of thing, like the Van Halen part. That's awesome. Um, this is a perfect time that I want to segue into. You made a, a great montage clip. Um, I think one piece we didn't talk about too much is that uh, not only you have obviously a full service you know, audio studio, but you do all the video there as well for people that want to record you know, music videos. So can you speak to the video part of it? Yeah, uh, actually it all started when I released my album in 2015. It was called Back in Time, which you came and attended some of those shows. Yep. And, uh, Back then I didn't have any good video system and I was hiring people to shoot my videos. And it, I realized first it was super expensive. Secondly, uh, it was the best way to promote your music, but it doesn't scale if it's gonna cost you $5,000 a video. And I had so many songs and so, uh, and, and 
just buying cameras wasn't enough. So I started by building out a, a little home stage for my own music. And, uh, and then I started collaborating with other people and they were like, hey, you know what? Can you make a video for me? Can you make a video for me? And I'm like, that's working. People seem to like this. And, and so I said, you know what? Um, let me, if I just create an st audio studio, it's not the whole story. But if I could create an audio and a visual experience behind it, you can get people all the way from here. Here's your concept to here's something that you can put out on YouTube. And uh, I actually built it for myself, but turned out that the last two years I've been mostly doing for clients because I've been so focused on making it work. But, uh, uh, but yeah, definitely video has been the main, main um, uh, way to, to showcase your work. And, and uh, yeah, and the studio has got all, everything you need from the stage to the equipment, the lighting and everything that, so a, a, a band could just walk in with literally no gear and, and create a whole video in three hours. And, uh, in a, in a, and the other problem was most people would take a month or two to edit a video. So I've got it down to where within a week you can get a video out. And because it has to be current, it can't be like, I waited for videos for over a month and two months and it just didn't work. <laughs> um, that's, no, that sounds really nice. And like you just said that you, from your own experience, you, you have taken on this kind of DIY approach of like, well, let me do this for myself. And then, you know, clients started liking it and very similar to what Alice does because they do their own uh, projects and everything that you're going to see tonight on the live stream is something that they've put together. And yeah. um, I know one thing that we were talking about pre-show that I would love to kind of have you share with everybody out there is um, you were talking about um, that you gave a talk at one of the local colleges here um, to like uh, future studio owner students. And um, you're talking about how your approach is to that. And can you share that with everybody out there that's watching? Yeah, uh, it was, I think uh, mid last year, I was invited to Showline uh, to talk to the career development students, uh, for their, actually the students for their career development class, uh, audio engineers. And so I gave them the talk about my studio and what I do. And, and, uh, and then it was question answer round. And they were like, most of the questions were, how do I get started? How do I build a studio that's better than the other person's studio? How do I price my... Uh, my services are to compete with others. So the, all the terminology that was being used was, how am I going to survive because there's a better studio out there? Someone has more money and they can, or because they've got the better monitors or the better pre-amplifiers, they're going to be, they're way better. And what I told them is, it's it's not about, uh, it's not about the brick and mortar because everyone can buy a microphone. Every Today's world, you can get a super nice microphone for $100, $200, right? So it's more about the relationship that you're building with the clients, with people. And um, and so, and I think to the point which you had asked me to comment was, it was more about us working together as a team, even if it's across studios. So right now, for example, with Robert Lance, I, I go there quite often. I talk with uh, Rob and Tina. I've also been to London, uh, London Bridge Studios and talked with Jonathan Plum. So it's not like, what. Well, in fact, uh, there was a video in December which Jonathan Plum sent me to do. So, and I called him and I said, thank you. And he's like, no, I knew that your studio was the ideal studio because you've got the video concept. And that girl came in. And so that's a, a clear example of Jonathan Plum saying, I, I, oh, I could have kept this to myself and hired someone to shoot and taken a cut. No, but that the idea was he's got some strengths. I've got some strengths. We all work together. And so next when I get a band, I tell them, hey, this is not for me. There's, there's a much better studio out there which could do that for you. And so working together, then everyone's going to like, I wouldn't have got that business if I was cutting down some other studio. And they were like, no, I'm not going to send it to those guys. So that's the concept of working together. And the other one was also working with session musicians. Uh, we all working together and, um, and not saying that this is what I want. And if I don't get it, I'm not going to give it to you. I'm not going to work with you. We work as a team. So two things, working as a team, working together, and, and uh, also building relationships with the client, which I think are too powerful versus I've got the Neumann U87. You can do amazing stuff. The client doesn't care about that. They care about what's the experience like. Am I going to get my, my song on time? And it's going to be the best effort. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I couldn't have said it better. And like we were talking pre-show, I think it's such a refreshing point of view to um, embrace the the group concept. It's very similar to what Alice does and everyone that's connected to them, the dancers and, and me and you know, other bands and DJs, and anyone else that's been on this tour that it hasn't been about 
being selfish. It's been about how do we make this the best thing that it can be? And if it's maybe not your strength, then maybe it's somebody else's strength. And yeah. kind of network and connect to each other and be this this community, really. Yeah. I think awesome. that's the best way to make it work. Okay. We've got about two minutes. So uh, kind of on the same uh, lines, but um, what do you have coming up? I know with COVID-19 and everything, it's kind of hard to know, but you, you actually have things that are going on. So what can you kind of speak to in the next uh, minute, please? Yeah, uh, right now, uh, hoping to uh, grow my clientele, but if it weren't for COVID, my next steps for the studio was to bridge the real world with the virtual world, because this studio right now was taking a song, putting it out there on the internet, making a video in the studio. But I also wanted to bridge that with actual live experiences and how do I get that to happen? So the next step would have been uh, a word studio's live experience, wherein people who are working with the studio can now showcase their music on a live stage. And that would, was scheduled for 2020, but uh, depending on when things open up, uh, working with, with um, either a venue or multiple venues to bring these talent to that venue. Because I think uh, in today's world, a lot of people kind of hide behind the screen. So now to get out there and perform too is the next step. Especially because I work with a lot of new artists who have never been played live sometimes. Uh, because a band is a different kind. They'll go out and play, but artists, singer songwriters don't have that platform. So I want to build that platform for, uh, I've built a, a virtual platform. Now I want to build a real platform too. So that'll be well, the next yeah. step. Well, it sounds awesome, George. Um, it's been a pleasure catching up with you and um, sharing your talents in your studio with everybody out there. And uh, I wish your, your family well, stay safe. And hopefully when all of this is done, I'll get a chance to come by that studio and actually see it in person. <laughs> so oh, well, that'd thank be you. Great to have you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Scott, and everyone for having me. Right, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Alan.